there was a time, a time before life, when giant masses of magma were thrust to the sky. The formations empowered the land to mold the giant rocky mountains. Deep within their soul, treasures awaited for the quest of man. daily, the streets of San Francisco were far more elegant than the small mining town of Butte City, Montana. But the disquieting thoughts of this Irish-born miner were not upon the majesty of a city. Instead, Mr. Daly had a very important meeting to attend. James Hagen, a shrewd businessman of notable financial success in San Francisco. was uneventful? Far less uneventful than the meeting, Jim. Come, they await your arrival. Good day to you, gentlemen. Daly? George Hurst, often called Uncle George, had become a tenant of great wealth through his mining ventures. Lloyd Tevis, a tight-fisted and masterful financial genius of the syndicate. What brings you to San Francisco, Marcus? Perhaps looking for some culture? Marcus has traveled a long way to be with us. Your letter sounded a little anxious, Marcus. What does bring you here? This gentleman was uncovered at the 300-foot level in the Anaconda. Looks like copper ore. Not pure, but a rich copper. The vein is five foot wide and runs deep. The mountain is full of it, I tell you. Well, you know we only favor gold and silver. But it's not gold or silver, I show you. It's copper. We've always done well with gold and silver, but copper. Where's the market? It's in telegraphs and telephones, and when electricity spreads across the country, that's the market. And that's just a small part of the market to come. But how soon, Marcus? How soon before a market? A few short months, but we'll be needing to develop the anaconda and build a concentrator and smelter to drop production costs. I've stood behind your schemes before, Daly. And we've invested in the anaconda. I prefer to tight the cinch myself. And now you want more money. I'm not sure I can go along on this one with you, Daly. As sure as you're throwing a shadow, there's rich copper under the anaconda. If it's gold and silver you're looking to, you'll find it in copper. It's copper we should be going after. 
far more valuable it will be. None of you have ever doubted me before. And it's not the time to doubt me now. You're talking a lot of money. And it's plenty of money you'll be making. James Hagen listened intently. He now wondered how many other men before Daly had such visions. It was a belief the outcroppings released free gold to travel to the stream beds, trapped within sands and gravels. In the valley, there would be water to test the gravels. of a mountain stream would carry the sands and gravel over the sluice boxes, the gold captured against the riffles. The cleanup from the sluices would bear a man's pay for his anxious toil. In July of 1862, a major strike was hit at Grasshopper Creek in southwestern Montana. The site of Bannock bristled above the valley floor, becoming a haven for the prospectors probing to nearby drainages. Not far from Bannock, the rich gold fields of Alder Gulch brandished the mining camps of Virginia City, Nevada City, Circle and Central City, all in the same drainage, flaunting some 6,000 people by late 1863. In the spring of 1864, Last Chance Gulch was discovered by four Civil War drifters, and the young mining camp of Helena became a regional center of commerce. The gold rushes in Montana were becoming a curiosity among the populace back east. Congress drew attention to the Northwest when proclaiming Montana a territory in 1864. The year of 1864 is vivid among historians, for still another major strike was uncovered at Confederate Gulch near Helena. The Gulch was considered the richest site in the world. One miner proclaimed he uncovered $1,400 in gold to every seven pounds of gravel. The resourceful Chinese survived by reworking many of the abandoned placer claims considered unprofitable by white labor. By 1870, there were reports of nearly 3,000 Chinese working in Montana territory, most under a veil of persecution. With the opening of the West, overland freight teams from Utah supplied the camps with an abundance of goods, including guns, ammunition, and enough whiskey to drown the loneliness. 
1866, the Wells Fargo system ventured west. There were gold shipments, passengers, and mail to haul. The fur trade had lured the paddle wheelers to the unmoored currents of the Missouri and to Fort Benton. The cumbersome and slow queens of the river now floated a different cargo, massive supplies for those lured by the gold rushes. The local men of commerce awaited with open arms to ease the burden of bearers of gold. For surely the prospectors couldn't survive in such a wilderness without a shot of corn whiskey and a good cigar. During the Civil War, the North depended on gold bullion to help finance the fight against the South. The great irony is that Confederate sympathizers working in the gold fields of Montana supplied much of that gold. The federal government also required gold to maintain credit, especially in foreign trade. To supply the greater demands for gold, the miners had to find a faster method of removing the immense overburden from the countless drainages. The hydraulic method, first introduced in the gold fields of California and Nevada, carved its way through tons of great overburden, and the gold danced among the sluice boxes. To supply water to the hydraulic sites, reservoirs and miles of overland ditches and flumes were constructed. Ditching companies charged for the water or collected a share of the recovered gold. The lone prospector with a few hand tools could usually locate enough placer gold to survive. But those with a greater vision looked beyond the placer fields, deserting the streams in search of the mother lode, the valuable minerals captured within a tomb of hard rock. The steel and sledge, the single jack, the only way to carve a charge hole. There were charges to prepare, powder to humble the tempered rock, the blasting cap to kindle the explosion. to secure the charges. Free gold could not escape the mortar and pestle, a crude and laborious method of crushing the ore. Later, the powerful steam-driven stamps crushed the ores with a conquering cadence, releasing the particles of free gold. To capture the gold, the sluicing method with water and mercury was commonly used to withdraw the valuable gold from the crushed ore. The mills varied in size, some with only a few stamps, other mills with many. Local money supported the buildings of the stamp mills, their operation often depending on nearby gold and silver mines. Although Montana was showing signs of development, it was difficult for miners to attract outside capital to the region. 
the territory was too isolated from transportation for hauling ores to distant smelters. In the 1870s, placer mining was still active. Drainage after drainage had been worked and worked again. By 1876, there were nearly 500 gold-bearing gulches varying from a half mile to 20 miles in length. Rich but often short-lived placer claims were common, like Silver Bow Creek, where the miners camped at the small site of Butte City. Granville Stewart, when first observing the region in 1865, described it as a site of rich-bearing outcrops of gold and silver. Some of the silver leads assaying better than the famous Comstock Lode in Nevada. The rich but complex ores under the Butte Hill lay dormant until a William Farland returned in 1874 to patent rich claims. The 1872 mining law now allowed miners to gain ownership of mineral deposits. William A. Clark, a fastidious little man, showed up in Butte about the time William Farland was looking for capital. Clark had become well-heeled through his merchandising trades in Bannock and Virginia City. Although his personality was like last year's bird nest, he presented the populace with a local bank and his shrewd instincts as a businessman. Butte was showing signs of growth as the development of new mining properties unfolded against the town. Smelters were built, the Dexter and Centennial structures the first to rise. With the discoveries of the Alice, La Plata, Burlington, and other rich mines, Butte City was attracting hard rock miners, men looking for a day's wages. In 1881, the Utah and Northern Railroad reached northward to Butte connecting a shipping point to Ogden, Utah. With the arrival of the first railroad, mining in Butte was finally becoming steadfast. Hard rock mining could no longer be overlooked by those skeptical of the isolated territory. Northwest of Helena, the town of Marysville took wing when Thomas Cruz discovered rich gold deposits, and he called the mine the Drum Lubbin. Millions of dollars in gold were disgorged from the depths of the mine. The small independent miner was a man of chance, a man of risk. He would sink his last grub stake into a few more feet of drift. Charles McClure was one of those men. He had been financed by St. Louis investors, but they balked over poor assay reports. During the last working day, McClure and his men discovered the richest silver vein known to man. Granite became a leading mining camp. As mining developed in isolated regions of Montana, immigrants from depression-torn European countries looked to the territory for a new start, a job in America. They would settle for less than the fortune seekers. A mining and banking firm known as the Walker Brothers of Utah had become savvy to the reports of rich Montana ore. In 1876, the firm sent their roving prospector to look over the Alice Mine in Butte. His name was Marcus Daly. Marcus, the youngest of 11 children, left his impoverished Ireland in 1856 for America. He worked his way to the gold fields of California and the rich Comstock Mine in Nevada where he learned the trade of the hard rock miner. With a keen nose for ore, Daly joined in partnership with the Walker brothers and bought the Alice load for $30,000. Daly remained in Butte in the employ of the Walker firm, resigning himself to the task of overseeing the mining property. In the meantime, William Clark had become successful with his mining interests in Butte. He had foreclosed on William Farland in 1877, gaining control of the Dexter Mill and its properties. Clark developed the original Calusa, Mountain Chief, and Gambetta mines, and in 1881, built the Molten Mill. Like monoliths, mills and smelters silhouetted the Butte Hill.
Daly sold his interests in the Alice for $100,000, then purchased the third interest in a small mine known as the Anaconda. Soon after, he became the sole owner, but his resources were becoming slim. He reached to a mining syndicate in San Francisco, to George Hurst, James Hagen, and Lloyd Tevis. They became partners with Marcus Daly. The silver ore was rich, 30 ounces to the ton. During the first year of production, 8,000 tons were treated at William Clark's Dexter Mill. As the shaft of the anaconda became deeper, the rich silver deposits started to play out. The syndicate in San Francisco was becoming nervous. At the 300-foot level, Daly directed his men to drive a crosscut. The men toiled for days, ton after ton, blast after blast. As the smoke cleared, there appeared not silver, but instead a rich copper vein. Marcus Daly and his investors no longer had just a silver mine. Instead, they were tenants of a new treasure, copper. Remember the Ontario mine in Utah? We've done well with that mine, haven't we, Lloyd? And it was Marcus that pushed it our direction. And the anaconda has paid its way. I'll gamble with Daly. Marcus, these blank checks are yours. You start writing. When they're gone, there'll be more. Gentlemen, I really think we ought to go along with Marcus on this one. Gentlemen, let us get started. Let us get started. When Daly returned to Butte, he bought adjoining claims to expand the properties. By 1883, work was underway on a smelter 26 miles west of Butte. Smelter men were imported from all over the world, mostly Welshmen, men keenly acquainted with mining and metallurgy. In 1883, Northern Pacific Railroad linked Montana to the nation with a transcontinental route. In July of the same year, a branch line reached Butte. As Northern Pacific spread its rails to other mining camps, the stage had been set. Civilization could now truly stake its claim in Montana. Near the smelter at Warm Springs Creek, Anaconda proudly displayed its landmarks of a spreading town site. Anaconda became known as Daly's Company Town. Many of the structures, including a company store, were under the control of Daly's growing enterprises. A correspondent for the Minneapolis Tribune wrote, for a distance of 30 miles to great clouds of smoke that rise from among the mountains, indicate the location of Anaconda and the greatest copper smelter in the world. By July of 1885, the Utah and Northern Railroad pushed its rails from Butte to Anaconda. The same year, Daly's smelter was completed. Work was for the asking. Nearly 3,000 men worked in the mines, mills, and smelters. Butte rose from a population of 4,000 in 1882 to 22,000 in 1885. The Cornishmen and the Irish were some of the earliest inhabitants of the Montana mining camps. The Italians, the Swedes, the Germans, the Finns, Yugoslavians, nearly every nationality made up the great melting pot. The Irish were perhaps the most distinct, for they eventually inspired both the culture and politics of Butte and idolized Marcus Daly. The different nationalities often congregated to their personal neighborhoods. Nationalistic attitudes among miners often prevented the bonding of workforces. 
Differences, often hatreds, were so deep, some miners abandoned their job at one mine to work at another, to be with their own kind. Although ethnic friction existed in the dangerous underground workplace, an accident would draw the men together with an untarnished loyalty. With the introduction of new technology in the underground mines, yearly production of ore was greatly increased, but the working place of the miners became more dangerous. Machine drills were replacing the agonizingly slow practice of drilling charge holes with steel and sledge. The drills, often called the widow makers, spewed fine quartz particles into the lungs of the unsuspecting miners. They called it miners' congestion, silicosis. The fatalities were high. Under dim candlelight, the miners worked long hours, often seven days a week. They had to stay alert. A man could fall to his death down a chute, a manway, or an endless shaft. Accidents were common in the cage and hoist areas. If a hoist operator failed to stop the cage at the surface, the men rode the cages to the sheave wheels at the top of the gallows frame, falling to the deck or shaft below. Deep under the Butte Hill, poor ventilation starved the miners of air. The caving of ground and premature explosions often proved fatal. There was ill supervision of the many inexperienced immigrants and questionable labor practices. Many mine owners varied in their regard for the underground workers. Both Clark and Daly knew the men worked in a dangerous environment. They also knew good wages produced a contented miner. However, history has clearly shown that not all mine owners were as generous as Clark and Daly. Like so many industrial sites in America, Butte and Anaconda were also filled with sulfur and arsenic smoke. The unfortunate traveler from South Butte traced his way not by landmarks, but by the hacking cough of his forerunner. Domestic chores were often hampered by the smoke. A woman complained of hanging clothes to dry, only to find them dirtier than before. Yet Butte had become a place to settle, to raise families. As Butte became larger, it also became more prosperous. Butte had grown from a meager tent town to a famous silver and copper producing giant. By the 1890s, Montana had become the bedding grounds for both the small and large mining operations. But in 1893, the silver miners were bludgeoned with the monetary collapse of silver. Hundreds of mines in Montana, Colorado, and Idaho shut down. Thousands of men were laid off. Only the mines able to fall back to other minerals survived. Within days, the silver mines of Butte, Alta, Granite, Comet, Hecla, Castle, Elkhorn, and many other camps came to a final rest. The Butte copper mines now held supremacy in Montana. As Butte became more prosperous, a fierce competition festered between Clark and Daly. Their animosities were fueled not only by their growing empires, but their cultural and religious backgrounds. Marcus Daly was an inspired Irish Catholic, where William Clark, born in Pennsylvania, was the descendant of a British Presbyterian family. Although both men were Democrats, their loyalty to party was not a preference over the smoldering feud which lasted for 12 years. Many historians have proclaimed that when William Clark ran for the position of a delegate to Congress in 1888, Marcus Daly, for political reasons, swung his support and the Irish votes to Thomas Carter, a Republican. Clark was incensed. 
To the delight of the industrialists and politicians, Montana became a state in 1889. Marcus Daly preferred his town of Anaconda as the site of the new Capitol building. Clark fought for Helena as the meeting place for state legislators. After a long campaign and with greater persuasion thrown in, Clark blocked Daly's attempt with a vengeance. Helena became the permanent center for state politics and perhaps a more fertile ground for Clark's political aspirations to become a United States Senator. The author of Battle for Butte, Dr. Michael Malone, reflects upon the feud. What a hound. What a hound. The, the feud came to its climax and its bitter, very bitter climax in 1899 when Clark, who was now in his early 60s, made a belated attempt to get elected, and this time by massive bribery of the Montana legislature, he succeeded in getting elected. But the United States Senate, in a very rare move, ejected Clark, or more correctly, forced him to resign in 1900. And this really was the climax, uh, the, uh, the, the nadir, I guess would be more appropriate, of the Clark Daly feud. We don't know if Clark actually said the words that have so often been attributed to him, but you always have to quote them. And that quote is, I never bought a man who wasn't for sale. It has been said that Butte was a city for all people, all faiths, and all ages. And it was a city for Frederick Augustus Heinze. The third of the Butte Copper Barons and a member of the next generation, truly, a much younger man, was Fritz Augustus Heinze, the product of a wealthy German-American family from New York City. Heinze came to Butte at the turn of the 1890s, a college-trained mining engineer, unlike Marcus Daly, and erected the Montana Ore Purchasing Company. Before his success as an industrialist, Augustus Heinze found a job as surveyor of the underground workings of Butte Hill. Heinze eventually had plans for the maps, and time would prove both Heinze and his plan brilliant. With George Hurst and Lloyd Tevis dead by 1899, Marcus Daly and his remaining partner, James Hagen, held control of the Anaconda properties. Amalgamated Copper Company, developed by a group of Standard Oil executives, made an offer to buy the Anaconda Holdings. Daly decided to sell, yet serve as president of the new trust. James Hagen sold his interests outright, ending an era when Marcus Daly and his partners groomed an infant Montana mining industry. The conglomerate, Amalgamated Copper, was now introduced into the lives of the Butte miners. Although Marcus Daly was serving as president of Amalgamated, his health was failing. Marcus Daly died on the morning of November 12, 1900, in New York City. With the passing of Marcus Daly, the mining world lost one of its most prominent figures, to be mourned by many, especially the Irish. Upon the death of Marcus Daly, the feud between Clark and Daly finally ended. Clark was elected and served six uneventful years in Washington, D.C. With his survey maps and the mining law of 1872 firmly entrenched as an ally, Heinze employed the little-known Apex Law to his advantage, literally stealing valuable ore from neighboring mines, from the conglomerate Amalgamated Copper Company. The Apex theory was simple. When a vein appeared at the surface of a mine owned by Heinze, his miners could extract the ore, even if the vein entered ground owned by neighboring mines. With a battery of attorneys, Heinze held at bay the litigation measures rained upon him by Amalgamated and the Independents. Their patience was waning over their loss of valuable ore under Heinze's piracy armed with the Apex Law. Court rulings handed down by Butte Judge Clancy, a Heinze puppet, 
forced Amalgamated to shut down its Montana holdings. Blaming Heinze for the shutdowns, an angry crowd of nearly 10,000 men assembled at the Butte Courthouse to hear Heinze's speech. Standard Oil is my enemy, but they are your enemies too. If they crush me today, they will crush you tomorrow. They will force you to dwell in Standard Oil houses while you live, and they will bury you in Standard Oil coffins when you die. But on December 1st, 1903, a special session of the Montana State Legislature was called by Governor Toole. And it was during this session that Judge Clancy's decision to shut down Amalgamated was overturned. Almost immediately, Amalgamated reopened their minds and, just as quickly, declared war on Augustus Heinze. The relentless attacks on Heinze began to methodically destroy the empire Heinze had so brilliantly created. Heinze soon realized that the end was in sight and that his defeat was irreversible. But in one last moment of genius, Heinze was able to engineer what most would consider the impossible. Through secret negotiations, both in Butte and New York, this amazing manipulative man arranged to sell all his Butte holdings for a princely sum of $12 million to his arch enemy, Amalgamated. And with this final act, so came the end of the historic War of the Copper Kings. Amalgamated now possessed an even greater stance over Butte and the economic base of Montana. Thousands of men worked in the mines and smelters of Butte and Anaconda, East Helena, and the Great Falls Refinery. In 1909, John Ryan took the reins of Amalgamated as the new president. Not only was Ryan instrumental in Heinze's sellout, but also welcomed the opportunity to purchase William Clark's mining properties in 1910, ending the role of the large independents in Butte. Amalgamated spread its wings over much of Montana, changing its company name to Anaconda Mining Company in 1912. As the company expanded, it eventually controlled electrical power by forming the Montana Power Company and heralded the arrival of the Milwaukee Railroad with its electrical demands. After the turn of the century, Amalgamated had initiated the eight-hour working day. The average wage was $3.50 per shift. The unions asked for more and for safer working conditions. Amalgamated and its president, Henry H. Rogers, did not recognize local unions. Strikes were a common event. The local unions with unorganized and corrupt leadership spurred split loyalty to their membership. Among the organizers, the Radical Socialist Party pushed its views over the working miners. In June of 1914, the anarchy among unions placed the Butte Miners Union Hall in the war zone. Members of the American Federation of Labor dynamited the Union Hall, representing the Western Federation of Miners. To secure order, federal troops arrived in September, remaining for several months until the rioting had dropped to a lull. In 1917, the worst hard rock mining disaster in American history rocked the nation. An underground fire swept through the bowels of the speculator mine, and there was no escape for 168 men. Sonny Powers, a miner from Butte, a man suffering from silicosis, recalls the speculator disaster. Most of them were gassed from the, you know, the timber burning and everything that caused the gas. But there was a lot of them burnt too. But uh, horses and everything, horses tried to climb up manways, you know, to get away from the, they found them far way up the manway. And they, they had no chance to get up a manway. But uh, they were trying to get out of there. But uh, if you kill a mouse underground, an old miner will belt you in the whiskers. When you see the mice heading out, you follow them. Because uh, the mice, 
they, they let you know that there's something wrong. With the speculator disaster a strong issue, 15,000 workers walked off their jobs. The strikers attempted to form another union, but their efforts were futile. Until Frank Little, a representative of the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, a wobbly, arrived in Butte. Frank Little, he came into Butte in IWW. And he was trying to organize the IWWs in Butte. And uh, he was doing a pretty good job. He was a great talker. And he had a crippled leg from a mine accident that wasn't quite healed. So uh, he was staying above the Finn Hall there on, on uh, North Wyoming Street, by the old where the brewery was afterward. And uh, one night, six gunmen went up there and beat him to a pulp shoved a towel down his throat, went out and dragged him behind the car and hung him on a bridge. That trussles toward Anaconda. Frank Little got, got a rotten deal. And he never harmed nobody. He was a little guy, crippled leg. I helped him when I was a kid. When I was about nine or 10, I see him over there putting out leaflets to the men as they come off shift. There were the streets, the Anaconda Road was black with men. And they're coming down from Wyoming Street from, from the uh, diamond mine, and that they'd come down, join in that bunch going down the Anaconda Road. And boy, you can't imagine how many men were working in Butte at that time. There's 20,000, I guess. Well, we'd help them put out the leaflets. We were just kids. But uh, he, he was just in there to do a job, and they seen that he didn't get it done. But they hurt themselves more by hanging that man because the miners kind of got together after that. And they carried him to the cemetery on their shoulders from uptown down out to the Mountain View Cemetery. His grave is still out there. I got a, a copy of that inscription that's on that grave, murdered by the Copper Trust for helping his fellow man. The death of Frank Little was one of many tragedies centering around the union unrest in Butte. During the struggle to find common ground between the company and unions, Seemingly mad acts were committed by both sides. For some residents, the quality of life in Butte was perceived as the black heart of Montana. And yet others, such as journalist and poet Burton Braley said, At first, Butte seemed like a godforsaken hole. But once acclimated, I became as staunch and true a lover of Butte as the oldest inhabitant. Once again, Butte was an amazing paradox. This time with a distinct dividing line between the small and exclusive club of wealth and the laboring many. For although Butte in the 1920s was a city of sweat and toil, it secretly displayed a distinct touch of cosmopolitan charm, very obviously placed there to serve and satisfy those who had reached the pinnacle of Butte's very own aristocracy. Within the city that never rested, its open spirit provided the masses with fraternities, lodges, orders, sporting events, and many parades. The production of copper in the Butte mines was exceeded in value only by that of Rand in South Africa. Butte had become the largest and wealthiest concentration of populace to the east. Spokane to the west, and Salt Lake City to the south. Although Butte had become known as a city of wealth and prosperity, it had also gained a reputation for sin, toughness, and squalor. While Butte had become the center of corporate mine development and a haven for most miners in Montana, there were many smaller independent mines far beyond Butte. They were widespread and varied in size most lacking the technology of the Butte mines. In the tobacco root range of Montana, the Nichols mine stands in defiance at an elevation of nearly 10,000 feet against the windswept ridge. Clinging to the face of the rugged outcropping, ladders reach to the open portals where interconnecting drifts were blasted in pursuit of the fleeing gold. 
The small mill, housing three stamps, crushed the ore before it was lowered by a tramway to a nearby haul road. In the Pioneer Range, southwest of Butte, the largest silver mill built in Montana lies abandoned against the east slope of the Continental Divide. The once massive Elkhorn Mill was developed by William Allen, a mining promoter financed by both English and American investors. The mill was installed with the latest equipment and became operational by 1921. The mining operation only lasted a few years, for the mine was underdeveloped, not able to supply enough volume of ore to the giant mill. Financial problems, a major flood which destroyed 13 miles of railroad, and the Great Depression of 1929, all added to the demise of the mill and town site. The heavy winter snows and vandalism have now imposed upon a once noble enterprise. Its structures cradled in silence. Throughout western Montana, countless mining camps rest in dormancy. Their remains, a reminder of small towns reaching for prosperity. In Marysville, only a few buildings now stand, as if monuments to once generous times. Mrs. Ann Courting experienced those moments. Well, when, when my mother came here, she couldn't understand why there were so many widows here. And uh, so they explained to her that uh, these uh, husbands had died of silicosis for the most part. And there were many of my relatives, and that was a very long, slow, and painful death, and it was heartbreaking to watch. And so these, uh, there were widows left here, and they raised their children by having a few cows and a garden and things like that, and I often wonder how they were able to do it. But the, the people of the town stuck together, so they, it was just like one big family. The train trestle was a playground for us after the train was taken out. We used to cross over there and go over, take our lunch and have picnics down on the other side. When it was taken out, uh, the whole town felt just terrible because we always thought that, you know, maybe the town would come back again and be like it was. But, uh, and the same way with the depot, we just were heartbroken when they started to tear the depot apart and take it out of here. I was going to grade school then and we used to watch out the windows and watch them taking more boards off and more boards off. And uh, so it was a, a sad time, just uh, like the mill was, mill was a show place and we just all loved it and to have it go down the fire was such a terrible tragedy. It was often the small, independent miner that discovered the original strike that fostered an industry. The independent miner hasn't changed much since the 19th century. He owns a small piece of ground, but always with a mission. In his independence, he appears to float upstream. Larry Ward is one of those men. If I had to do it all over again, I think everything would go exactly as it has. I've enjoyed every minute of the mining and living in the mountains and just being free. In his quest, the miner was led into regions where valuable minerals laid stored under a blanket of obstacles. The miners seldom faltered in their search. Wherever a promise of rich ore was located, the mines, mills, and settlements grew from their hopes of simple prosperity. Their sanctuaries now decompose 
under the tempo of the passing seasons. The big ox, bald butte, jawbone, little daisy, bell of the castles, snowshoe, golden cloud, silver bell, gold coin. While the underground miners worked at their trade, above ground, the bucket dredges, graceless and untiring, rearranged the landscape and their greed for gold. They could dig deep under the gravel bars, often overlooked by the placer miners of the first gold rush. The dredge would leave behind a huge wake, the kind of furrow a giant, untamed worm might leave. Appearing first in Montana in the late 1890s, the dredges chewed through Grasshopper Creek near Bannock. As they became larger and more efficient, they performed the work of 2,000 men. They were a gigantic floating sluice box, the gold easily surrendering to the mill within. today is now confronted with the same demands for valuable minerals as his forebears. He works with sophisticated mining equipment, allowing higher productivity in a safer workplace.
The miners have supplied minerals that endured both the political and economic repercussions of the world. The mining industry introduced people, capital, transportation, and commerce to Montana, anchoring its economic base. The impact of frontier mining altered and transformed the land, yet captured the spirit of a growing America. The immigrants were beckoned to America. In the mines of Montana, they prospered. Many gave their lives in pursuit of their dreams. Yet there is little celebration for the men and women of the mining industry. Their accomplishments have slipped into the envelope of time. They were paupers asking for little, a few gaining fortunes to fulfill the dreams of others. That fella's in a pretty good bin, uh, but I was sniffing around here a while back. Came across something that might interest you, gentlemen. I did. So if you'd be wanting to follow me, I got something to show you. Marcus, this is another one of your schemes. The vein. It's a big one, it is. Even bigger than the anaconda, Marcus? Oh, even richer. Well, what's it going to cost us this time? How many times have I told you never to doubt my nose for sniffing, Rachel? It's a future gentleman. You have to look beyond your noses. <laughs> 